Hey, hey, this is Carlos. Uh, I am the founder and CEO at Product School. Today, I'm here with another founder, Miki Alon, who's also the Chief Technology Officer at Gainsight. Hey, Miki. Hey, Carlos. Good to see you again. Good to have you on the show again. Uh, you're an OG. I remember when we first had you, we had a great conversation mostly around PLG and the intersection between uh, customer success teams and product teams. So happy to dive deeper into that as well as, you know, getting a, an update from your perspective on what's, what's going on now with the future of product management. You have, a, you have a finger on the pulse. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to kind of dive into that. So let's start from the beginning. For, for people who might not be uh, super aware of uh, Gainsight yet, can you please give us an overview of like, what your company does? Sure. Uh, at Gainsight, we help companies build a durable growth business. Uh, we have three main products. Uh, one is community, we, which we believe we can drive community-led growth. Uh, and then obviously we have the customer success platform, which is helping you with customer-led growth. And you have the product experience pl platform, which I own, which helps you with product growth. We believe that to build efficient growth and durable growth, you need to use technology to scale and to tap into kind of user demand, understand how customers using your solution, and also reach out and close the loop with customers. And for that, we believe those three channels are really, really important uh, and feed into each other. And now we're also seeing in the market that, you know, uh, companies obviously are now measured against efficiency, uh, right? It's no longer, just two years ago, we saw like massive uh, investments and uh, growth at, at, at any cost, but now um, the companies that are efficient, cash flow positive, you know, they, um, uh, they're, net revenue retention uh, is good, they will get the, the best valuation as opposed to just a high growth. Uh, so at Gainside, we're trying to really uh, build everything you need to run a, an efficient SaaS business. And one thing that I found really unique in your business is that you have these three business units uh, that are interconnected, focused on consumer success, community, and product. Most of the other product tech companies that I've seen have an intersection between like user acquisition and product or data analytics and product. You guys seem to be very focused on like that retention component. So why did you take that, that approach? That's a great question. I think uh, if you look historically, and I'm, I've, I've led the uh, global product development team at Marketo for three years as well, and so if you look at it's talking on the evolution, uh, Salesforce obviously pioneered the cloud uh, and SaaS and everything, and they wanted to create this, and they created customer relationship management. Uh, but then, you know, the cloud happened and, and SaaS happened and uh, Marketo and HubSpot and all these tools came in and, and they tried to take their customer relationship to the next level with the digital offering, with personalization, uh, ended up serving mostly top of funnel, you know, the, the acquisition part, which is a, it's a massive challenge and there's a lot of needs around customer acquisition and personalizing that and creating a brand awareness and so forth. And then uh, the, the SaaS took over in the past, I would say, 10 years or so. And with SaaS, a big shift uh, has happened uh, in the market because you have to, in order to be a sustainable business, you have to, in order to thrive, you have to retain customers, right? In the past, you know, do, you do this marketing, customer experience and everything, and you can, you know, do like customer marketing, but in the end, your customers would down, download a solution and it's up to them to, to be successful. With SaaS, that's no longer the truth. Suddenly, uh, the opportunity is to help, help customers uh, get up and running quicker, but you have to make sure that they're renewed. You have to make sure that they actually derive enough value from your product in order for them to, to stay with you. And if you're not, you have a leaky bucket, right? So at Gainside, we say, hey, who is going to be the next generation of customer experience? I think market automation is doing a fantastic job, but they have a huge blind spot, which is the product. And again, the product is still, I feel like, uh, uh, misunderstood completely because that blind spot is, is massive. If you think about where are your customers spending most of the time and how do you acquire uh, customers today? So acquiring customers is very, very expensive. It's, it's going up, but 
customers want to even start small, you can use your product to acquire customer better, but from that point and throughout customer lifetime value, it means that throughout the fact that they need to re re you need to retain them and then expose them to additional product or functionality or increase their spend, uh, you need to optimize that type of experience. You need that. So customer experience, in my view, is becoming the product experience. It's 95% product experience, right? This is where customers spend their time. And at Gainsight, we want to make sure that we, we offer you that solution. We did realize, by the way, uh, speaking about PLG, for example, and what's happening in PLG. So you see like companies that are building PLG from the ground up, very simple to use solution. They don't hire salespeople. They sometimes don't even customer success. But what happens as soon as they hit five or 10 million ARR, um, either some other player builds a simple tool like them and just cheaper, uh, because they just didn't build a moat around their solution. Because eventually, if you want to go up market, you need more functionality, you need to cater to the bigger customers, or you offer more solutions. This is where sales and customer success have to jump in. And this is where it makes sense for having like high touch mode. So in Gainsight, we are the only solution that can blend high touch and low touch and zero touch. This is like, and I think that most PLG companies, as they go up market, they, not, they actually are building sales customer success uh, um, uh, to kind of really cater to this bigger uh, solution. So we, we believe that it's, uh, that's going to be the next generation of customer experience. And again, the no star for us is to help you scale, to build a durable growth business. So you're not just throwing more people at the problem, you're actually throw, like using technology to scale what you do. I, I noticed you used the word or the term customer experience multiple times, and, and I'm very interested in that. I want to double click because the one hand, obviously product or product experience is important. On the other hand, customer success is important. And I've seen this integration happen, hopefully now more often. Um, I remember when the PLG term was coined, was maybe around 2016, 2017. Uh, by the way, when did you publish your, your book on, on PLG? Right, I wrote some blog posts and like work on the book at 16, we published it at 17, uh, together with OpenView. OpenView is like yeah. coined the term, but we, I, I contribute a lot of their initial blog posts, uh, writing about that. So obviously there's been some time for the market to adopt this mindset and it now seems more obvious that retention is the new growth and it's actually cheaper and more efficient to you know, do a good job keeping your users happy and renew them instead of just bringing new customers all the time and you know, having them leave after a year or so. Now, in terms of like the maturity model for companies, like what is it? Like what is the next level for companies that are fully integrating product management with customer success in what you call customer experience? I think it's for them to get this alignment. Uh, first of all, again, like expansion and retention are kind of tightly coupled. I think that if you improve, imagine improving one point of retention in your company, how much that will contribute to revenue as opposed to improving one point in conversion in trials. Usually one point in retention, it would translate to way, way more revenue for you uh, in SaaS, right? So if you really try to build a, a sustainable a, a business that has leverage and growing very efficiently, uh, you make sure that retention is there. Once retention is there, then you're open up for expansion. So I think the next level is to kind of have this uh, interlock relationship between when is the right time to have customer success, uh, have this one-on-one -on -one human interaction with, with your customers and when do you use the product to carry some of the heavy lifting uh, required to drive adoption? Because eventually, um, the, your customers are actually trying to be sort of served. I, I like to kind of figure out by myself, and I like to speak with an expert when it's truly strategic dis discussions and I want to hear best practices. Um, so I think the interaction is to create that uh, journey and map that customer experience journey and decide at the company level, what should be part of the product and what should be a, a high touch. And there's a lot of uh, consideration going into that. Like one is like, what's the error of customer? Like what's the minimum threshold that at that point makes sense to apply uh, a human interaction and what should be, you know, uh, maybe support, but that should be the kind of, uh, it should be on the product to deliver. 
And we're seeing that uh, it's, it's a combination, like throughout the life cycle, even if you're a high paying account enterprise, still you have a lot of users and you need to make sure that the product experience is always attentive to users. It's number one, enabling the users, making sure that the product is intuitive, collecting feedback from end users, because what we saw is you cannot rely on one champion as a customer yet, because the, if the end user is not happy, uh, you know, things happen. One, they feel there's no ROI. Second, like, you know, they, they, they kind of decide either to leave the company because uh, this is the daily tool. Uh, so it, they, they influence the, the renewal dramatically over the decision on tools. So the user, even in high touch, even in top down decisions, uh, I think you have to worry about the end user. That said, it's not going to be just that. You know, when, for example, we use uh, Amazon Cloud and Google Cloud, uh, at some point when, when our spend hit a threshold, then we started to have closer discussions with, uh, with Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, and then they start to also listen to what do we need in the future, right? This is where the product needs to have the customer success input from strategic accounts, uh, which are paying you seven figures. What are they, what's their strategy next year? And is it aligned with your product strategy? Because that's not going to come from the end user feedback or usage. Yeah. So that's kind of the intersection that we feel from customer success, helping drive the business and the product that kind of helps scale the business. And, and that's, a, that's an evolution that I've seen in, in product led. Uh, obviously the definition was, yes, you have to satisfy the end user and create this bottoms up motion. And I agree with what you said, that it's also important to have the buy-in from the top. So thinking about how those two relations connect, it's critical, not just one or the other. Kind of like reminds me of this, this concept around B2C is the new B2B. Like no more, oh, it's B2B. We just need to make the decision maker happy. We don't need to worry about the user experience. Whatever, we assign a contract and then we show the product. And then one year later, well, we'll have a conversation. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a still notion of chooser versus user. Um, and I think you have to worry about both. Uh, I think uh, the chooser is definitely important. Um, but eventually ROI for them will come from the user. If the user doesn't use the product, right. the chooser, uh, right? So and vice versa, you can't just rely on users because sometimes, you know, there's like a, a change in the company or uh, they don't know necessarily how to translate true ROI uh, from from your solution, so I think it's a combination, uh, but definitely the end user should be your focus because you can be super successful, the chooser even like you as a company, but they choose other tools. That's the worst that can happen. You built a category, you at Marketo, we built a category, we built the strategy, and suddenly, we, you know, in some cases, we, they love Marketo, but they buy something else. And that's like really painful. And then so we invested a ton in the product to make sure that we, we retain those users and, and deliver value to them because, you know, that's eventually what the true value, the intrinsic value is. One thing that I'm, I'm curious to learn from you is um, in terms of org design, we understand obviously there's a chief technology officer. By the way, you are the most product-led CTO I've ever met in my life because like you can go deep in both technology and business. Um, a few years ago, we were all like evangelizing the need of a chief product officer at the table. And I think that's that's more mainstream. But if we want to really elevate the role of the customer experience or customer success, what is the highest ranked person in the organization that can really advocate for this? I think it's like the customer experience leader is, is I think it's like the, the one that should advocate and should see both the digital aspect as well as the human interaction and like uh, everything about the customer from post sale perspective as well, like uh, from onboarding to, to adoption to expansion. Uh, but it spans also like you need to get like alignment around different uh, C-level. I think you have to get alignment from the CRO, um, you know, in CMO, it's 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 because I think eventually it's a it's a, it's a team sport, uh, and I think you have to have all these uh, uh, people at the table, and still the CPO I think has the most impactful long term impact uh, on the business uh, because you know it's very hard to go fix a roadmap or product. Uh, it's it's way slower. It's way more expensive. So those decisions. Um, are critical, uh, and I think again, 
they can truly leverage and embrace product-led or product-assisted notion uh, and prioritize the, the roadmap to have an assistant. So, by the way, I'm seeing another trend, which is like product-assisted as opposed to product-led growth. So, in some cases, you do product-assisted in areas that you say, hey, still we're going to speak with sales, but we're going to have the product assist with scale. Uh, but it requires prioritization from the roadmap of, from the product organization. So I think eventually CPOs uh, have a massive impact on the customer experience end-to-end, -end, right? Eventually, it's, it's about the product. If it's intuitive, customers are happy, your customer success leader is happy because their retention numbers are amazing. If your product is not, then re the customer success are, are basically dealing with product gaps and you see burnout and they will not be ultimately be able to fix those, right? So eventually, I think the CPO still is, in my view, uh, one of the top like leading positions that you want to make sure that they are very customer centric. Um, and they are aligning and, and partnering with the customer success leaders and, and CRO. Yeah, that, that's how we structure our current organization. We have our customer success leader, part of the product organization, reporting directly to our chief product officer. I know there are companies that are taking this even further and defining like a chief customer officer, which I think it's, it's awesome. But ultimately, respecting and elevating the role of this the, the customer success and not just calling it customer support not putting it at the end of the process just to fix bugs instead of just being in, a, in the conversation even before a user becomes a customer and really trying to care and and do what's right by the user it's something that i i know it's it's necessary i also know it's really hard for companies that have been operating under a traditional model that kind of works right like hey if i have a strong enough sales team i have good relationships with people who've been buying me for years like why would these people need to change like what are some of those reality checks that you've seen that are pushing these companies to now consider a more modern approach i think they're just saying that how uh, efficient products get crazy valuation and make their job uh, much much easier so this is why i think also like coming from product perspective long term um, eventually that customer, chief customer officer, like still they need to be kind of product uh, uh, with a strong product background at least. So they know what the company delivers, what can be done, what to influence the roadmap. But look at those companies that in the past, you know, years and, the, and, and their valuation. Look at Figma, for example, like really powerful tool, uh, very focused on customer collaboration, all those features grew like crazy and their numbers, their, their efficiency is amazing. Look at their NRR. So it's, it's a product that actually deliver meaningful value um, and lead, which leads to really strong retention, strong expansion numbers. So all the other counterpart in the, in the company are doing a better job because the product is doing a better job. Vice versa, I didn't saw a lot of examples. Like if the product's bad, then at some point, initially you can get away with it. You can get away with when you kind of the first in the category, the, the end user and the chooser are not experienced, but um, those companies suddenly get competition. Uh, and at some point, suddenly they're starting to see key account that was like, uh, usually they would win very easily. Suddenly uh, they, they lose those accounts. And usually the number one um, uh, reason is not necessarily like, oh, these other companies just cool or the, uh, no, we still love you as, as category leaders, but the others actually delivering great, great products, great functionality. Maybe it's better pricing, maybe it's better functionality, maybe it's ease of use, but it's, it's a reality that is, is suddenly going to hit you. Um, and there's going to be more uh, in any market, in market, in market automation, at some point uh, after Eloqua, Marketo, uh, there's, the, the suddenly became like more and more market automation, more and more vendors, and and it's up to the product. Still, I think Marketo is differentiated, and this is why they're able to be strong on the on the larger accounts uh, because of the product, not because of everything else. So. Yeah. I feel that is a reality that is going to happen. It's just a question of when. Sometimes you can just be, you know, if you're the category leader, there's not enough traction in your space, you can still get away with it. Totally. I agree with you. I, I've seen this happening in MarTech, as you mentioned. Uh, eventually, these technologies become commodities. 
And like what separates one from the other is, is the quality of, of the product. And that's something you cannot win or just fix at the end. Um, I heard you talk about NRR, net revenue retention. And I think that's great because back in the day, most of the key metrics that investors would use to value a company were like cost of CAC, like yeah. customer acquisition cost, and maybe lifetime value. But that was pretty much it. Now we're taking a deeper look at the funnel. So what is NRR and, and how do you guys use it? That's fantastic. I think so. So net revenue retention or net dollar retention is, is a good indication to see how well are you retaining uh, and upselling and cross-selling your to your customers. So it's combines together whether if it was just growth revenue retention, it's how well you retain. Uh, but when you think about net revenue retention uh, or net dollar retention, it's about uh, it, it takes into account both churn but also upsell and cross-sell. So the and that number, you know, obviously, if you're hitting 120%, 140%, it means that you're way more efficient in terms of the way you continue to grow your install base. Um, and this is why it actually means that you're able to uh, build a sustainable business. So NDR is becoming the number one uh, uh, metric, both for investors and also in public sector, like in public companies. Uh, if you NDR, especially PLG companies tend to have very uh, very good NDR metric because once you start using it, you, you grow by consumption. So for you to spend more, for example, if I spend more in Google Cloud and Amazon Cloud, they, need, they didn't need to invest in almost anything, right? I start from X amount of uh, ARR and then I grow to 10X ARR. They did not need to invest in X investment, right? This, for them, it's like, just like very, very organic. Um, and I think that's where the it shows how uh, how well your company can grow, and it's it's almost unstoppable business, as opposed to bad NRR, which means that you're kind of not either have an issue. With, you, you, your cost of sustaining or retaining customer is too high. You have a leaky bucket, so you will never be able to truly become a capital efficient business. Uh, and a capital efficient business is eventually should be the goal for every company. If we assume all companies will just continue to lose money, it's not a really sustainable way, right? We'll see those market downturns every time, but at some point people say, hey, you should pay, the, pay back the, the investment. Uh, yeah, that's a great reminder. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and, I, and I really like this metric because when uh, using churn alone is not enough. It almost assumes when you are going to lose a customer, but it doesn't include the opportunity to upsell or cross-sell a customer. Like technically that should be the end game, not just keep the customer as is. Exactly, and I think from a uh, roadmap perspective, uh, think about that, like how many of us do prioritize the stickiness of our product and investing in features that drive stickiness. We invest in features that differentiate and create wow effect but the sticky features sometimes are not the same. Sticky features, for example, can be collaboration feature, right? Sharing, integration, because uh, the more you get customers to put more data in your system and then you enrich the data and then you share the data and you allow them to collaborate, you're creating this stickiness that it's very hard to swap and very hard to, to switch to another uh, uh, solution as well as just getting more value uh, because you integrate all these systems and you allow them to collaborate, so you increase productivity, you grab more mind share. So those are uh, features you can prioritize to drive the, the GRR and NRR uh, efficiently. And then second is like, we need to do also, uh, uh, product leaders need to do uh, a, a, a discussion or run a discussion with, with uh, product marketing and go to market team saying, is the pricing and packaging still, you know, optimized for what we deliver, right? It's usually, it's like, oh, it's uh, it's very, kind of, we're trying to do simple pricing. And, and I think if you're not moving towards some consumption-based market um, pricing and then adding some uh, features that customers will actually pay for as an expansion, uh, you're losing out on, on the opportunity to build a healthier business because your customers might not be able to pay or consume all your features especially in B2B, it takes them quite some time to really take all the advantage of what you build. Why not to just slice it and then you can actually optimize the price and then expand. Um, you will get faster deals and more organic expansion as opposed to create always unnatural pressure points 
And you as a product manager kind of always need to deliver a ton more features. Everything is for free, like not for free, but under the same subscription. Um, why not to just, hey, I have like small companies, larger, I can actually build packaging that if they get the bigger package, they actually pay for more. And then you can also prioritize your roadmap. Yeah, where do we see more growth opportunities? Let's invest in those set of features. If everything is the same bucket, then it becomes very tough to really optimize our product roadmap versus revenue, right? It becomes very, very tough. Yeah, oh, man, we could do a whole episode on pricing. And I would love to do that, actually, because there's so much evolution on that. There's this constant debate between freemium versus free trial versus now there are models that include both. And I think that's a good approach because putting a cap on usage of a certain feature instead of just saying, no, you have to pay in order to use the feature, it's an artificial barrier. Allowing the user to use actual product for real and then decide, well, if you want more of this, then is when you have to upgrade. Seems to be like a better way for the user to get full value. Absolutely. And I think eventually, if you look at the long term, the only way to drive growth is with more products, right? But if you have one price for your product, then expansion is very tough. How do you expand? If you have only seed base, so companies don't just hire like crazy, and so the, the seed base is limiting you. If you do consumption plus premium features, now you're allowing to, your sales team to truly drive expansion and growth. Um, as opposed to kind of really maximizing the first deal and it just makes their life, I think, harder because they're trying to optimize the first deal and once the deal is done, they have to run for the next customer because there's nothing to expand and the expansion is, is very marginal. So I think, you know, the discussion should be like, can we build the product and functionality and, and, and it's not necessarily freemium or free trial. Let's say you have a customer, but can I just sell them like a, a, a smaller package and then grow, uh, as opposed to try to, again, squeeze everything to the first deal and then deal with like uh, stressful renewal and like, it's always like, you know, uh, and then not having good uh, focus on, on expansion as well. Um, and so I think that's, that's a different mindset. And then if I think on product leaders, as product managers, if we knew, hey, this is a new pricing and packaging, Here's what we can actually charge for. We're building that into the pricing as well. Then we can actually balance our roadmap in a better way because uh, we truly can drive more features. It will drive growth. Today, we kind of uh, drive features and eventually it's like to help win more, but not for expansion. So ask yourself, you know, uh, how can I build features for expansion to drive more organic growth? And that should be roadmap plus pricing and packaging. And that's a discussion that, uh, companies has to do and it's, it's sometimes just overlooked like they keep the old pricing and packaging and just like and and the pro and kind of uh put all the burden on the product to kind of somehow figure out growth and um i want to make sure we make a little bit of um space to discuss community i know that uh you guys acquired a company called insighted yeah. and that connects nicely with the other two products that you have on on product and customer success so how does this complement what you have and what do you see, what is the role that community is going to play in the customer experience? Yeah, so um, as you, you saw, there's like, I um, think evolution-wise was marketing-led growth and then product-led growth is, is just helping you scale for the product. So community-led growth is what we bet as, as the next kind of a channel to grow your, your business and customers. Um, and, and for us, we're seeing that, you know, customers actually spend quite some times in the community helping each other, right? And then like all oh, providing more feedback and looking for best practices. So we're seeing that as a fantastic channel to help you uh, build a moat actually. If you have a strong community around your product, you're getting more expertise, you're getting deeper feedback, uh, you get, you know, you tap into the future demand of your, from your product because you're seeing the discussion, you get this uh, awareness or tapping into those discussions and you're able to also communicate them uh, to them back like here's the roadmap and allow them to do like uh, feature prioritization allow them to vote because it's kind of uh, a community that they actually know your product they use your product uh, so it's not just like you know fly by or just like you know those early feedback so I think we see it as very very strategic to, to growth, uh, and if you don't have a community, then you you have a, a gap. I think you know the product itself is not enough, 
and customer success is not enough, you have to make sure that you are facilitating discussions and communication with customers. And that should feed back to, as a customer, if you're a customer, then it should feed back to your uh, product experience and the customer success play to see, hey, this is a, this is a way to, to, to scale. There's another trend that is called digital-led. Companies are trying to improve ratio between how many customer success to how many customers you have. Um, and increasing that ratio at some point, that ratio means that it's not going to be uh, very personalized anymore. And one way to address that is through community. You can have, hey, hey all customers are here. They're going to share knowledge. They're going to be exposed. And as customer success, I can post things that are relevant to, to uh, 100 customers in my book of business or 200 customers. So I'm scaling the way and it stays there. What's nice about it, it actually stays there and it's searchable. So we believe it's, a, it's another channel uh, to, to invest in. Um, and, and it's going to be part of any kind of uh, uh, SaaS business that wants to scale. And I, I agree. I, I mean, Figma, to your point, is a great example, not just of a product-led mindset. They also have an incredible communi community-led mindset. And I think those two things combined ultimately are generating unstoppable growth, as you define. So um, I'm, I'm very excited, you know, because when we started product school, we also invested, we're still investing very hard in, in community. And it felt lonely when we were talking about this because it's hard to measure ROI, at least in the short term. But I, I think if we take a longer term approach and we truly have not just in terms of dollars, but actually like value for people, because at this point, it's not only the company evangelizing, it's also the users of the same company connecting and helping each other out. It can be also extremely cost efficient. Yeah. But if you, if you think about like what is, uh, if you ask the Marketo, uh, what was their big like differentiation and one of the key modes is actually the marketing nation. We had a huge community of marketers, uh, both customers and non-customers. It was bigger than Marketo. And then, so, yeah, I think very early we had like 5,000, you know, marketers as part of the community uh, so obviously it, it helped us position the brand, be the thought leaders, learn from them. It's, it's very bi-directional. Learn from your community is really important, uh, but own that. And that was like the biggest mode that helped drove Marketo to be very iconic. Pulse for Gainsight is the same. Like Pulse is actually community and many customer success, whatever tool they use, they still come to Pulse. Um, to learn, to share ideas, to, to grow the customer success community, and now the product community. So I think uh, obviously communities is really uh, one of the modes that you have to consider if you want to go serious about scaling and efficient, capital efficient growth. Well, Miki, it's been a pleasure to, to learn from you one more time. Thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Thanks for having me.